So, hello, my name is Kelly Johnson. Um, I am the team leader of Scholarly Resource Services at Griffith University in Brisbane, Queensland, Australia. Um, so I'm going to kick us off with the Griffith University resource sharing story. So um, Rice is going to speak after me about a more specific crisis, while I'll be speaking about a bit of a slower moving um, crisis slash opportunity that I think will uh, probably be familiar to those working in many libraries, uh, trying to meet multiple expectations with very tight budgets. So this is our Griffith resourcing goal in Marie. So provide access anytime and from anywhere to the scholarly resources required for teaching, learning, and research in an online and on-campus environment. No worries, super easy, right? Okay. Um, not really, of course, but we are closer than ever. In the last few years, we've been able to untangle a lot of our services and practices to identify what we think has been a key missing piece interlibrary loan. Well. Uh, I do have to admit that uh, when I told a few colleagues about this talk, they're a bit perplexed, like what is there to say about ILL? Um, but actually, I think that really highlights um, a lot of opportunities we've been missing in this space. It was definitely time to reimagine it. So today, I'll be telling you a little bit about our context, which is, um, I think, will be different from a lot of people in North America. Uh, our project story with ILL, uh, share some of our lessons, and also a few of the catalysts that got us thinking more creatively about how to fit ILL in a better resource position for us. First, Australia. We are a very big country, but a very small market. We only have 43 universities in the country, and we all, almost all of us belong to the same consortia. So we do deal with the same large international vendors, so you can imagine we might have less pull in some things for some of our particular needs. We do have very large student cohort, cohorts generally. Our smallest university is 6,000 students, that's the smallest. We also have a very long tradition of distance education. So there's a very strong expectation for online courses and online resources, of course. So that affects our collecting. Uh, and also, uh, we already preferred um, universities for the most part, and in practice, Griffith is basically E only. We very rarely buy print resources anymore. Uh, we also have to deal with currencies. They are not our friends. The exchange rates are very volatile, so it's hard to plan, and um, it can be very expensive. So in a year where the US dollar um, drops or changes dramatically, we've had to cancel a huge amount of subscriptions. So that's where another place where ILL can really help us fill some gaps. We're also a big country. We're far away from each other, but from the rest of the world. So for interlibrary loan, uh, loan of physical items, uh, that takes a long time, and our gas, our petrol prices are very high, and postage fees, so it can be very expensive. And we have some specific legal obligations uh, to provide access to textbooks and learning resources for every single course. So we do have to budget for that as well. We are a member of Libraries Australia Document Delivery Lab, which you'll hear a lot about soon. As part of our national library, our, we have our national database, and that's shared in WorldCat. New Zealand, of course, has their own national library, but we um, share together. There's a standard price for dollars and loans, which is really good for planning. Um, and the system handles the bulk of our invoicing in Australia New Zealand. Um, and it's based on BDX. It does not integrate with TAPASA, which will come into play in the project story in minutes. Um, but of course, we can't get everything we need within the Australia New Zealand region, so we have to use a lot of other systems, which adds expense and complexity for our staff. So Griffith, we are a big university. We've got six campuses in Southeast Queensland. We have a digital campus, which is considered an equal campus. So of course, that influences our online marketing. Uh, we do have to support um, all courses and students from undergrad to PhD to postdocs. We've got research institutes, a medical, dentistry, law, and MBA schools. So. Of course, those resources can be very expensive, especially the subscriptions. Um, so again, ILL will come into play with helping us with that. Um, and we have a relatively small budget um, compared to other universities in our region. Ours is almost the small. 
small. <laughs> so at Griffith, um, my team, Scholarly Resource Services, manages interlibrary loan uh, resource sharing centrally, which I'll again explain in a little bit. And our frontline teams, which uh, man the help desks, they do the scanning and loan of the physical materials from the campus. Our volume has been decreasing, um, and we do have um, relatively small print collections, which we are significantly reducing as well, and we do not have any off-site storage. Um, so we are taking a lot more into net borrowing position, which isn't always great for sharing community. We also belong to a Bonus Plus membership, which is on mediated book loaning. Um, but it uh, is not available to Alma users, and many universities have moved to Alma recently. We haven't, obviously. So that's really shrunk our ability to share collections with other um, universities. And it's only print. All right, so in, that, in 2019, um, the ILO budget was, um, it used to be in a separate fund. It was moved into our main library resource budget. So it seemed like that might have been a bad thing, but actually that was one of our catalysts it opened up a lot of possibilities for us. It made us much more flexible about how we um, uh, target our spending, and we can be a lot more intentional with interlibrary loan um, in relation to all of our other resources. All right, so I've been a staffing profile on Flux, but that's just true all the time for everybody. <laughs> but we have had quite a few restructures recently, but more specifically about um, ILL. Uh, in 2014, there was a separate team in the lending area, and it was moved into the scholarly resource services area, which kind of gave them a different focus now. Um, and by 2018, uh, I was able to integrate the team fully into the larger team. There's no ILL team per se, um, and we had a lot of retirements, so that made things real flexible and moving, uh, was able to move things around. Um, so to today, uh, I have less staff overall, um, but, and more services were put um, in our area, but we were able to handle it better than we had in the past. So that was one of our other catalysts. Um, so currently I do um, have a few people who are focusing on ILL, but they can do other things as well. Um, and um, the, as I said, the FLS team is across all the campuses, so there's a lot of people involved in the scanning and the loading. So this has been really great overall because now that they're absorbed in that team, we can do a lot of cross-skilling. It's really increased the variety uh, of uh, work for the staff, so they're feeling a lot more happy and ready for changes in the future. Um, and I can allocate people uh, to fit the different peaks and troughs in the work, and then we can add more services in and move people around more quickly. So it's been a really great change. So oh, our journey, uh, it truly has been a journey. There's a lot of surprises, uh, disappointments, and hard work, but I think we're getting to a really happy destination. Um, so hopefully you will get some takeaways from here, what to do and what not to do. Some things are out of our control, but uh, I'll go through it very quickly. Uh, so before our project time, uh, we did use VDX. We migrated to the SAS, and then the contract was coming up for um, exploration, so the, it was decided that also VDX is at the end of life, it's a good time to go to market, and a budget was approved for a project. So in 2017, I'm just calling it project, it has a fancier name. Uh, our goals were to shut down VDX and implement Relay, which has a lot of good um, user experience and good support in Australia. There was a budget for a project manager, which really was someone who only worked one day a week to make sure the paperwork and things were in order, but actually all the work was done operationally. Uh, so that's good because you get a lot of control of configuration and workflows and some experience, um, but it's tons of extra work on top of your already busy schedule. I joined in March. Uh, it was already in progress, uh, and especially developing an interim workflow for uh, when we shut down VDX and um, implemented Relay. That was going to be a manual workflow. So um, kind of by May, June time, uh, the contract negotiation got bogged down because our state requires a very complicated uh, form for IT vendors, so that it was taking them a long time to do that. And then OCLC bought Relay and everything just stopped for a while because they were trying to figure out what to do. 
that wasn't great. Um, but we had a temporary uh, solution called, I'm going to call it TILS. Um, it was basically we created a web form, some information went to an email, then it went to staff who had to manually add that information into lab, which we used for our auditing our inputs. So by August, the VDX contract had expired, so we started that TILS process. At that point, we're like, well, that is going to be way too hard if we don't know what's happening with this contract. So um, we're trying to think of a better way to do this. And um, this is just a good example about getting out there and meeting people in your area because there was a new team that was sitting near us who actually were the SharePoint experts. Um, we didn't really know much about it. We had some chats with them, and then they helped us set up a semi-automated workflow, which worked out really well. And with that, the frontline team could get some things checked, but they do a catalog check and check if they um, were undergrads, which we didn't allow to use ILL at that time. So by October, we realized we were not going to get that contract signed, so we had to close the project because we had that year-end deadline. There was a risk we might not get the money again next year. So we were going to continue with TILS, aware of the risks because it was short term. And I'm going to say spoiler alert, because that was October 2017. To this day, today, the staff are still using that SharePoint uh, temporary system. So I'll tell you about that in a minute. But yeah, that's what happened. Uh, but the good things for that, there was a lot of upscaling. We learned about SharePoint and LAD, um, and that triaging worked well for the frontline team because their circulation work had really gone down. They needed some work to do. Um, we maximized the actual systems we had in place. Um, and we increase collaboration. But of course, manual entry can be boring and error prone. It is hard to mo monitor the distributed teams. There are a lot of people involved. It's hard to make a decision. So the reboot year two, um, before we could even start, we had to prove that we actually did need the project in the system again. Because technically, SharePoint was free in the sense that it was available to us, and LAD was already part of our subscriptions. So there was no money we were um, being charged. But when um, I calculated the salary cost of the staff in the manual entry, it was way more than the subscription to Relay and Rapid ILL together. Um, and Relay, of course, would be a better user experience. And TILS was meant to be only for three months, and it did crash pretty quickly because there was too much data going in there to do some workarounds. So the project was approved um, to implement Relay and Rapid. We got the budget for the system. But by April, we were doing the contract negotiation for Relay. We got a lot farther into it. But our uh, security team found an issue with Relay that they would not sign off on. The vendor did not guarantee they were going to fix it. And it looks like Relay won't be developed too much more because it focuses on Tapasa. Tapasa was not for sale in Australia. So we tried to fix that SharePoint process a little bit, make it slightly better. Um, but by July, the project was closed again. Um, again, we weren't assured of the money. There's always good things. So there were some more uh, creative problem solving by our team. We learned about cybersecurity issues. Um, we had a lot more flexibility with our workarounds. And we confirmed there does need to be one service owner. Um, the, you know, we did spend time on really specific documentation that we now knew we were not going to be able to use again. Um, and some of our high users were becoming frustrated because we had no patron history or anything because it was just a basic form. So, it's starting to feel like a long project. Because <laughs> year three, right? <laughs> um, yeah, it was supposed to be done right when I started and we're still doing it now, obviously, <laughs> three years ago. Um, but, so we did our pre-project analysis again, and there were a few more things we kind of took into consideration. Um, so one thing is just being aware there were some costs, but um, we really shouldn't let that sway our thinking, but we were aware that we had spent money on the operational costs already. Um, and we did prove the staff can handle manual uh, process, but does that really fit our values? good user experience, having meaningful work for our staff, and using automation, not really, no. Um, and also, there were no other options in Australia to integrate with the lab system, which we do need to still use. So um, the project board agreed it was time to take a chance. So number three, uh, implement TAPASA and implement Rapid ILL, which is sort of in the project, sort of not. 
Um, we got the budget. We be, we're the first in Australia to use Tapasa. It will definitely improve our user experience. Rapid has a lot of good qualities, and one really great thing with the time zone change with the US, we can provide things when the US is asleep and vice versa, so I think that'll speed things up. And no more SharePoint, <laughs> but it doesn't integrate with LAD, so we'll still have to do some manual entry. We can't use it for lending yet, unfortunately. So, October 2019, we did sign the Chapasa contract, it's so exciting. It's go live November 25th, so very soon. But Rapid was purchased by Ex Libras, so bleh, stopped for a while. <laughs> but actually, just I think two days ago, I saw my work email, they signed the Rapid contract, so it's definitely happening. So I'm super excited about that. We just have very bad luck with timing. Um, but some great things have already happened. We put in place the One Service Manager, which is me, so I've been able to do a lot of um, efficiencies and um, uh, streamlining of things because it's all in one place. So that's part of our outcome so far. Um, because Tapasa only uses one location code, that centralization was approved as well because we had seven and we had you know, multiple contact points, et cetera. It's all been centralized now and it's been saving a lot of time for everybody. Um, also, as I said, we did not um, allow undergraduates to use interlibrary loan. And part of that uh, SharePoint workflow was checking that, but it was too time intensive, so we stopped during the year one. Um, so what happened was they started you know, getting through because we stopped checking. So we had two years of sneaky stats of undergrads, and we saw that it wasn't going to um, blow our budget or anything like that. And also rapid, other rapid um, unis allow undergrads, and it's much easier for our configuration. So we got the approval. So from now, um, undergrads can use that as well. So that was a great outcome. And also, everything in the same place has made it um, much easier to pull our stats together and do some really great analytics. So how did it feel for everybody in this whole process for three years? Well, I picked this picture because I think for most of our users, they're kind of above the surface. They didn't really notice much change. It was fine. They had a form and someone to talk to if they had problems. Underneath, we were a bit panicked and doing a lot of work all the time. Um, but as long as it didn't impact the, the users, we felt like that was a good outcome. All right, so um, we did learn a lot over the process, but I have just top uh, five, so I can get through those quickly for you. Uh, so the first one is disruption. It's a total buzzword, but it was really good for us because we were very much stuck in a rut. Um, and this process was kind of an accidental st uh, staff development tool. Um, they really grew their agility and their confidence, and they're really, um, it's just really great to see them constantly looking for little efficiencies that we can implement in a lot of small wins. And the overall, it's much more um, exciting. Uh, we have to question our assumptions. This is a big one for me. Um, do you really need a system just because people use systems for various things? Do you really need one? You can get by for a long time without it. Uh, and stats, we stop collecting so many stats, we just use the reports when we need them, it saves us a lot of time. And it was great to have a very open-minded project board who encouraged that, but also required real evidence to make decisions. Uh, yes, and crowdsourcing, we really needed people um, from all areas of the library involved to help us um, solve problems, like the SharePoint workflow, I never would have thought of that solution. Um, but it was really good to have uh, one or two people who have a good overview of everything to make um, the final decisions. So that helped a lot. So each year the project uh, group got smaller and smaller, but we consulted much more widely. And of course that helps us um, raise the, pro the profile in the rest of the library. Um, it really feels like you're wasting a lot of work, especially when you redo the same project three times. But um, it's not. You're learning each time. We did a full workflows, diagrams, everything start to finish, and we just scrapped them and started over again a couple times. But you get a lot faster, and each time you do find more issues, you need to fix them up. Um, and this seems self-evident, but you should really save all your documentation, even if you close a project, because we did have a problem with that, trying to figure out what we did before. And um, be patient. You, you are going to have to try different methods. Um, you will find the best solution, but then you're just going to change it again. Um, and there were some uh, silver linings in that long delay meant the team realignment took longer, and it was more gentle, and it, um, people felt better about it. And also, when we started this, we really couldn't go to pass that all. It wasn't even available. 
now it's sort of available. Um, so we, now we're ahead of the curve instead of way behind. All right, so I'll just finish up with um, what we're doing now and what we're planning for the future. We want to bring all of our data um, from all our different um, systems and kind of mush it together so we can make better collection development decisions. So we're doing that by using Tableau and other um, business intelligence tools which makes it very easy to pull it together, clean it, and then quickly um, do different analysis with it. Um, they, it creates great visualizations. It's really helpful in vendor negotiations because you have a really clear picture about what's really happening with things. So of course we did um, ROI and cost of use type um, reports, but this is just bringing it up to the next level. And getting ILL in there has really um, uh, made a more accurate picture. So hopefully we can make a, take a more granular approach and you know, hopefully we can um, target our cancellations a little bit better because we may be able to cost effectively use ILL or vice versa, which I think will be exciting is um, looking at it a lot more closely, we can start purchasing the right things so we don't have to use Central Library Loan. Oh, that's me. Thank you. So uh, you, that's just a, a level of playing field here, the University of California has been up to some things. Um, so uh, we have a pretty broad manifesto to ourselves to approach all vendor, all publisher vendor negotiations um, from, from a, a year ago forward uh, with the idea of building open access um, into those uh, arrangements. Uh, we did anticipate that one or more of these could maybe not uh, have immediate success, and then we might end up in a standoff with one or more publishers. Uh, this was a conceptual problem. It is no longer a conceptual problem. Um, and just there's just a range of publishers uh, and attitudes and sizes and readiness and technological ability and how much they have to answer to their board and a, a, a lot of a lot of stuff going on. Um, and we didn't know how things would go. And on my campus, um, I was challenged with trying to increase our readiness and our resiliency in the event that we ended up in a standoff with a publisher. Um, so um, last summer and fall, we had a series of negotiations with the publisher that ended up, uh, I'll say, not succeeding yet um, as of February. Um, and there, were, there was university-wide, we have a 10 campus system, uh, and we mostly eyeball from each other when we can. Um, and, but we have, we, if we were all cut off by a single publisher, obviously that uh, removes uh, some of that uh, baked in resiliency. We, we wanted to um, look at what we could do at a university level, and then campuses have specific um, uh, amounts of latitude to also improve their own resiliency because there's some difference between the campuses. Um, but the, so the university negotiated a contract with Reprints Desk, um, which is a, a, a document delivery provider, and we got a, a negotiated rate with them. Um, but uh, to a certain extent, given the timeline of what was happening, campuses were, uh, I'll, I'll spin this as a positive, we were given latitude to create our own plans. Um, so uh, we have, there's a lot going on at the, uh, in terms of things to think about. Um, so we were worried about, um, this, I, I think you all know who it is, it's, it's the largest publisher, and we knew how many downloads we had per day from them, um, and the idea of even a fraction of that translating into IOL requests was a little daunting, um, and what the workload might be on IOL. Um, there's also some uncertainty about patrons who might be less familiar with using IOL, depending on the nature of your research. If, all of, if normally you were able to click on everything and you hardly ever use IOL because you work in clinical care and everything is just a click away, um, you might not actually be familiar with ILL and how well it works or how to make it work well. Um, there's also the challenge of communicating what is lost, what uh, what access has been lost. It's a very long list of titles, and people 
don't necessarily associate the journal title with a publisher. <coughs> of course, some of the society journals have, get shopped around and they change publishers um, from time to time. So uh, you may think that something is with one publisher and in fact it changed last year and you haven't noticed. Um, we did have a little bit of a concern. I'm glad to say this didn't happen, that we can tell, but uh, whether there would be somebody who disagreed with the objectives of the university, uh, which faculty have academic freedom to have their own thoughts. Um, well, they'd have their own thoughts even if they didn't have academic freedom. Um, but whether somebody would go in and say, well, the library said they would support me, let's see, let's see. I need 100 articles a day, and I'm just going to you know, game this system and see if I can uh, make it fail. Um, we're also, obviously, if you, if you have a subscription to something, you have 24-7 access, for the most part. Um, and what, how does that translate into an OLL operation that's only open during business hours? And kind of what, what would be the budgetary implications of copyright compliance in the event that this might turn into a, a quite protracted standoff, um, as has happened in a couple of European countries. Um, so uh, on, I'm on the Davis campus. And uh, so we looked at a lot of different things. I'm going to kind of go through them quickly. because I aware of our time and I'm standing to you at a break. Um, so where we were coming out of, uh, so we uh, we have a lot of, uh, our consortium office, the CDL, uh, has a lot of uh, business logic baked into our instance of EDX that moves uh, requests between campuses when we when one campus might have a subscription and another does not. Um, and um, Stanford is actually in that group as kind of an 11th campus. Um, and so we had a possibility of really overwhelming Stanford. Is anybody from Stanford in the audience? Oh. <laughs> uh, so I, I, I understand that we have overwhelmed you a little bit uh, as a university, but we wanted to um, be thoughtful about that and not um, not uh, damage a, a good relationship with Stanford if we could avoid that. Um, Rapid ILL actually showed a lot of promise, and Davis did um, on our own. Uh, we're the only one of the 10 campuses so far that's joined Rapid. Um, it has a lot of uh, going in terms of service level agreements that allow fulfillment within one business day. Um, they do have quite an international um, representation in their uh, group that would allow us to uh, potentially get off hours requests satisfied, as, as, uh, as was mentioned. Um, so if we requested something in an hour evening in California, someone in Australia might be able to satisfy it because it is their business hours. Um, and uh, they did have some data. They were able to provide us with data that showed that they are getting some fulfillment on weekends. Obviously, a lot of ILL operations are closed over the weekend, but there are some. Uh, so we were um, hopeful for that. And it does let you set up reprints desk as the lender of last resort. So it, if it tried libraries and it didn't succeed, it would cascade automatically into wrap it to reprints desk um, and simply purchase the article. Um, so we, we went with a, a combination platter of reprints desk and rapid ILL. I'll, I'll say that in the, in the last few weeks, we've moved to just using reprint desk on weekends, um, just to ensure that the uh, request gets satisfied, uh, unless it's from undergraduate. Um, so there was a lot of technology to um, upgrade. We were using um, Clio for uh, health science requests, and we were using uh, BDX for everything else um, because of the integration with Dockline on the Clio side, and then all this business logic that's with BDX. Um, we had to upgrade Clio in order to um, implement Rapid. Uh, implementing Rapid also had like a bunch of uh, challenges to it because of some choices that uh, we had made for ourselves when we implemented Alma, uh, which I sincerely regret now. Um, <laughs> yeah, but we'll see what we can do about that. Um, but uh, the, uh, the improvements did give, uh, give our Iowa staff a sense of excitement in the wake of, or in, in the midst of all this uh, kind of fear and concern. Um, and we, we did all of these um, upgrades in advance of, um, uh, of a possible standoff, I'll say. Um, uh, so we do, have, I, I mentioned we do have two ILL units. There's one for the health sciences uh, community. Uh, we have a med school and a vet school. Med we're the only vet school um, in the UC system. Um, so they satisfy uh, requests for that community through mostly through Dockline. Um, and then we have another one that serves basically the rest of the campus and uses PDX and um, and other OCLC um, things for returnables. Um, so the, uh, they have different cultures in terms of responsiveness and such. The health sciences folks really have a, like we need to get this article now, kind of um, framework to their work. Uh, they kind of assume that every request is urgent, which is um, probably not actually true, but it, it, you know, it's what they do with their um, clinical care folks. Um, 
and uh, we already had some night and weekend folks uh, at that branch working on some ILL activities, so they were doing some doc line satisfaction. Um, and so the easiest way for it to, we, we chose to up, expand our uptime of ILL by expanding it to the, have all of the hours of that branch library. And then we actually kept that branch library open during its academic year hours. We kept those hours for the summer and last summer, because um, at that point we were not certain if and when we might be cut off. It turned out we were cut off on July 10th. Um, uh, so that turned out to be a good decision. Um, but we, we also, in the, in the course of joining Rapid, and wanting to kind of see how well Rapid would work for us, we chose to move all article requests over to the Health Sciences Library, so they now serve all article requests no matter where the patron came from, which is, again, it's a, mostly a cultural change for the folks in those units, um, but that's, uh, we didn't have any retirements to leverage, um, so we actually had to work with our staff and um, get them to change things, um, which is its own. Um, it's, yes, it's a wondrous experience. Um, so the service hours, we, we incrementally added them as we panicked more and uh, looked more in my mind that we were going to um, have something. So we added uh, weekend hours first, and then we added weeknight hours, kept the health sciences library open over the summer um, to uh, match, uh, match their academic year hours. This, uh, so you also get into continuity of service things. We ended up being cut off on July 10th, but by, that, by July we knew it was near, and we didn't know if it would happen like on or before July 4th. There was a major NIH grant deadline on July 5th, so like we staffed someone to work on July 4th, um, and they just sat and watched Netflix all day, because it turned out there was one on our request that day, because we still had access. Um, but um, I, I don't regret it on that. We got to work on July 4th. But it, as, as this goes on, we are looking at continuity of service uh, issues in terms of uh, holidays uh, in the United States when we would not normally have uh, people working at all, and whether, whether and when you have somebody come in, and whether and when to have them, um, what, what hours they might keep on that day. Like, is it okay for somebody to come in for four hours, or do we need someone there all day? You know, I'm, I'm talking about like there's no library facility open to the public, just someone in the back office. Um, I'll just say we have 10 unions, and I can't have somebody really do this from home. Uh, and um, so somebody would have to come in, and then not anybody, not just anybody can come in on their own because of, you know, depending on your rank in, in your union, you can't be in a facility by yourself of a certain size because you have to be able to blah, blah, blah. Um, so it's a lot, and um, winter break is offering us some special challenges because we would normally be closed for 11 days in a row. That's a really long time for somebody to wait for an article. And a lot of bylaw, other requirements will be down. So there's a lot to think about um, if you're thinking about having a standoff with a major publisher. <laughs> and uh, you can buy me a great player if you want to know more than earth that's on these slides. Um, so we also had some updated, outdated policies. So we had a transaction limit for different major types, and of course it was different for capital even for undergraduates. But there was, you know, this kind of very formula, formulated thing from probably some part of the 1980s about who you were and how many transactions you could have per day. We just kicked it all out. Uh, you know, at this point, there are undergraduates who publish. And it, it seems really wonky not to um, allow them to um, place the requests in the need. And they could be placing requests on behalf of a faculty member and just using them out. So, um, better to err on the side of getting stuck with the patron. Um, we, again, based on data that we've had uh, based uh, on fulfillment over weekends by Rapid, we, we have chosen to move. Um, Every, all requests except for undergraduate requests directly to reprint's desk starting like Friday afternoon, um, just because they'll, they'll get satisfied much faster. And we want to we want to show ourselves as being a strong partner with the research community of our campus. Um, we didn't want to assume that everyone would want to use ILL. There's other ways to get some articles, so there there are a lot of open access articles um, even for this publisher um, uh, because of so many funding funders require uh, open access at this point. So people have, have published a lot of. Uh, Articles of access, either green or oracle or APC. Um, so we, we do have a page that uh, walks people through how they can uh, how they can find articles, what if, if they want to uh, use a plugin or they want to use um, Google Scholar or um, how they can leverage scholarly sharing. Um, I'll, I'll say that on what I've heard from faculty is that they're very reluctant to use scholarly sharing. They they make, they, they feel like they're at a half not university and that we are a half university. And I'm like, yeah, this is why we're trying to get away with paywalls, so that everybody can be a, um, on the same plane field. You know, but um, anyway, uh, and we did uh, have the subject like to create some like really short videos on how to do this, especially if there were folks who hadn't um, 
didn't have a strong tradition of using IOL and wanted to um, know how to do this. Um, so we, I'll, I'll say the fears about ILL uptake were, uh, I'm glad, to, well, for my own sake, I'm glad to say we're not well founded. So we have had a modest uptake of ILL. So this is for our campus um, only, um, but we got 30,000 students. So like, this is not a lot of, uh, you know, corresponding number of faculty. And then the, what, what is the turnaround time? So this is before we moved to using uh, reprints desk automatically over the weekend. So you can see the ones that are <coughs> that take 48 hours to get to us, it's because somebody placed a request either like Friday afternoon, Friday evening, or Saturday morning, that kind of thing. Um, and just other IOL departments aren't able to satisfy the request um, before like Monday. Um, so looking across the whole UC system, so this is the 10 campus <coughs> system of um, article request traffic. Uh, so the blue line, the upper line is our total requests. And the orange line is the subset of that that is for this publisher. So you can see that it's not overwhelming us right now. It's actually a very small percentage of our total IOL, which means that a lot of our uh, a lot of our campus communities are turning to other ways to find things where they are doing without. Um, and I expect that depending on who you are on the campus, you might have just bought the article directly from the publisher. I mean, you get a paywall. You can pull out your credit card, and if you're sitting on a couple hundred thousand dollars of research funds, you probably just pick by the article. Um, I'm sure there's some scholarly sharing. I'm sure there's some actions that I don't want to know about. Um, and I'm sure, but I'm sure there's a lot of people getting by with the abstract or getting by without the article entirely. They, they change the topic or whatever, depending on how tenacious you are and where you are in your in your uh, in your research uh, experience. Um, so we we do have uh, we've had uh, some really thoughtful and serious conversations about copyright compliance and what. Uh, Increased ILL traffic might mean. Um, even the amount of ILL traffic that we have so far would mean something, probably, um, in terms of copyright compliance. And uh, so, uh, folks, if you don't know, Georgetown and, and the, the Ohio State University um, have both kind of been uh, out in front of this, um, giving some nice uh, talks, some nice thoughtful talks on what does copyright compliance mean uh, in today's market uh, of e journals and um, and journal uh, saturation pricing is so much more expensive than it would have been in 1978 when Contu came out. I'll just say Contu guidelines are guidelines, and if you work within those guidelines, you are uh, declared to be definitely okay. But that doesn't mean that you can't be outside of those guidelines and still comply with fair use. So um, that's a whole other talk that I don't give. Those folks that are coming, you know, be you at the university, give those talks, uh, and I recommend them. So uh, our next steps will be determined in part by IML usage and how long this goes on. Um, but I'll, I'll say one of the legal protections is that you do have a plan in place, and we do have a plan in place. Um, and I, I don't know if that publisher is approved, so I'm not going to go into more detail at this time. Uh, so where are we going in the future? So we do have a system-wide task force that's looking at um, assessment of this, and especially taking a temperature read of the faculty uh, in particular in terms of how are they finding this uh, to be, uh, how burdensome are they finding this, you know, relative to uh, the support they have for the open access uh, stance that the university is taking. Um, so that'll be coming out in the next uh, month or two. Um, and we are uh, looking at the system level at how we might staff over that winter break and whether we could kind of uh, pinch hit for each other. So um, I proposed in the previous uh, talk, you know, do we need to stand up 10 people uh, throughout California to just to send out uh, ILL requests to reprints desk. I mean, that seems uh, colossally inefficient to have force 10 people to work, you know, on December 26th, when probably most of the campuses are going to be closed. Maybe one person can handle all of that traffic and work on one of the campuses.
thankful that um, we could play a part in that success story. Really, I just good job. I, you know, amazing. Thank you. Yeah, we were really glad. Oh, and I you were there. Say one more thing. In about six months, we are going to um, have a like a second um, interface of our platform now that will. I don't think you'd have to have a staff of ten people sending orders to read because that's will be like a unmediated. You know, as long as you pre-tick the boxes that you want to allow to be sent to us, it'll happen. Yeah, so, so we don't have to have staff. Yeah, but it'll be about six months away. I'll, I'll say, uh, this is getting buried by campus, because there are, uh, like UCSF doesn't have undergraduates, and my understanding is they just put reprints that staff or patrons can place their own requests because it's all of them at the, there you have it. Sarah's looking confused. Anyway, so I won't talk about UCSF. UC Davis, our, our problem would be that um, the requests go into BDX, and there's no auto magic way to, to get a request from BDX over to Clio to feed it into either Rapid or um, right. reprints test. So uh, I regret very much it's not a problem that reprints test can solve, but BDX is uh, probably not going to be improved uh, by its vendor, so um, but I don't know. We'll see what happens. Yes. Hi, Lisa Henschel from the University of Illinois Urbana Champagne. So I was really interested in starting an off camp comment you made, so you might be like, oh my gosh, what did I say? Where <laughs> um, you said that your, some of your scholars were sort of unwilling to use sort of peer to peer sharing because they felt like, I'm sorry, I can put words in yeah, no, they were too good to have to do that? That is exactly what someone, I, I've had uh, three or four different people tell me that yeah. it makes them feel like. They're not working in the United States, and I. I I'm not saying you agree. I, I, do, I don't agree. Yeah. <laughs> like, I, well, because I'm like, hello, nobody can afford to subscribe to everything. So, like, no matter what, that's why we have ILL in the first place, right? And our ILL traffic was never nothing, right? right? So, I mean, you, this is journal article requests, and then, I mean, we got a lot of the blue line is like all the other stuff not from this publisher that we don't have, you know. So. I'm, I'm like, you are, but, uh, but whatever. You know, when you have, so, you have thousands of faculty, there's going to be three. No, I just, I'm just curious, because I was like, oh, yes. more than one, so that's interesting. Yes. Um, so my other question with this is, um, do you need to subscribe to these materials at all, given the level of usage you're actually seeing requests and trainer my way Oh, that's a good question. Um, I, this is the screen I'm going to bring up. Um, so I, uh, you know, there's, I don't know what, you know, I don't know what's going to happen with our negotiations, I don't know how long it's going to take, and blah, 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 but this, this is not nothing. I, I can't just gloss past this copyright compliance part. So if we're ILLing, you know, all of the articles in an issue of, let's say, the American Journal of Americanism, it's a big thing, right? But um, if, if we're ILLing, you know, 100 articles per week from that journal, I mean, like, there's, I, I, I find that indefensible, and I don't, I don't have a law degree, and this is not legal advice. Um, so you should talk to your campus council if you want to do something. Um, but uh, it, the long tail, like do we need a big deal, I think is a, a different question. Um, and do we need a, I, I mean, I, on the other, wearing another hat, I hope that we get to the point where it, these journals are open access, and so there is not such a thing as a big deal. That I mean, somehow it is solved in a different way. Um, but you know, if, if that's going to take another five, 10, 15 years to make all those transitions happen, you know, do we need a, a subscription? Meanwhile, to everything, I don't know. That, that's the approach we take. We, we don't want to have interlibrary loan deals with publishers that are filling our gaps forever. It's, it's a temporary thing, but you need to use it more wisely. But that wouldn't be solving the problem long term. It's still expensive. Yeah, and I'll, I'll be interested to see, like, if we do. Um, so we, we we searched our procurement systems, all ten of them, uh, to see to find out who was paying what in terms of APCs over the last few years to different publishers. Um, so we could, you know, as an assessment uh, item, look across the procurement systems and see who has actually purchased an article directly from this publisher. Uh, rather than go trial out. Sarah is saying no. I, no, no, no. Um, I wanted to mention that the, so I'm at UCSF, so I'm part of this company. Um, the requests that we've gotten for elsewhere, those are for 2019 articles only. We have perpetual access to the vast 
vast majority of everything else that we subscribe to. Um, so that can be related to this as well. Right? Yes. Yeah, we're still seeing a lot of people with all their yep. back files. So this graph will, will get worse. Yeah. I don't know how, I assume incrementally. Oh, because... sorry, not elsewhere. The publisher. Yeah, the publisher. <laughs> well, <laughs> I was trying not to use their. The, the reality is this could happen with another publisher. So, and I, I want to clarify, we are not paying our bill, so they have shut off service, and that is fine. If I didn't pay my cable bill, the cable company would shut me off. Like, that is a normal thing, so I'm not, I don't want to, for this point, I'm not going to throw that publisher under the bus, um, because we, we got to a point where we had to pay our bill for over six months. And, and they gave us notice that they were going to do it. I mean, they were, as these things go, fairly genial about the fact that it was going to be happening. So uh, we, we have access to Grind, and that's not one of them. Um, but yes, so we have perpetual access to most journal content through the end of 2018, except for the so-called Freedom Collection. That, that collection does affect my campus <coughs> disproportionately because we have the vet school and we have the ag school. Um, but, uh, so this is just 2019 content plus the Freedom Collection for classes. Having, having talked about the Freedom Collection, uh, we now would have known who it was. <laughs> yes. So I, uh, I don't want you to miss your questions. So how about if I say that we'll both stay and answer questions. And we'll, uh, thank you all for your time.